Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that gracious uh, introduction, Lars. I'm delighted and honoured uh, to uh, to be here at the uh, Kavli Institute, having heard so much about it. And I must say, I'm very grateful to you for taking some time out this afternoon. Uh, I, I really appreciate that too. I won't detain you too long, uh, but I, I I think it's a great idea that uh, you've got here of getting people like me who are outsiders relative to the research community to say why we're here and why we're so pleased to uh, be among you. Um, I'm particularly excited by the vision of this uh, institution, which uh, which relies so strongly on collaboration and, and, and talking. Uh, I can think of one person who may not possibly have thrived as much as others uh, on this. Oh, you just have to be a picture here. Um, and I'd just like to begin with an, a- an anecdote that I don't think is in my, my book. Um, I think I, one of the things I, I cut out because there were so many like it. Uh, but it concerned an American biochemist who came over to St. John's College in Cambridge. Uh, and he was desperate to meet the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the great uh, quantum physicist uh, Paul, Paul Dirac. But he, he told me, this biochemist, that, he, that Dirac always had this very forbidding uh, um, aura, like a minor French poet. Uh, he put it. I still don't understand what he means by that, uh, but, but he said it was deeply forbidding and never saw him uh, say a word. And he was warned that if you happened to sit next to him at, uh, at high table, it would not be the um, uh, the sassiest experience you'd you'd had uh, at that t- at that um, uh, at that table. Anyway, uh, this bi- uh, biochemist had been there for I think it was six or seven months. Uh, and uh, he, each time he'd failed to sit next to the per- his quarry. But finally, I think it was the last uh, day of Lent term, he found himself n- sitting next to Paul Dirac, uh, who was sitting there in his, uh, in his gown. And true to form, Dirac said absolutely nothing, nothing at all, for 10 minutes while everybody else is chatting away. And this biochemist uh, said, uh, just at the end of the first course, or thought rather, I've really got to pluck up the courage to, uh, to, to speak to this guy. I will probably never have enough for opportunity. So he turned to him while Dirac was finishing that first course and he said, uh, Sir, may I ask what you're working on? There was absolutely no response. Second course comes up, nothing. Third course comes up, nothing. Cheese course comes up, nothing. Dessert comes up nothing. And then the coffee arrives. Still nothing. And then suddenly (coughs) Dirac turned to him and said, why do you ask? (laughs) (laughs) True story. The the conversation did not have a very exciting ending after that. I don't think that's going to be happening here uh, uh, somewhat. Anyway, the reason why I'm uh, I'm here, or the principal reason why I'm here, is I'm uh, researching uh, a, uh, a new book uh, I'm coming to uh, coming to the end of my uh, uh, of, of my research period, coming to that horrible time when I have to start writing, uh, and it's a book that I, in my modest way, regard as the, the central miracle of science, and I mean that. Right? That is the mathematical intelligibility of the universe. I love wildlife documentaries. I love looking at physics experiments. I love life as much as anybody else does. But if you ask me on my deathbed, what is the most surprising thing about this place that I have been inhabited? It's the fact that the universe is intelligible mathematically. I'm not alone in that. Einstein, great, great physicist, great philosopher of science, remarked on this uh, in uh, one of his last letters to his great friend Solovine in 1951. And he said, I can't think of any other word to describe this apart from a, a miracle. And he said, I know people will, qu- he will, he will quibble with that, fair enough, but that's a word I'm going to, I'm going to use. And of course, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to, 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 to extend that if we didn't have this miracle, our subject, theoretical physics, would just not be possible. Now, in 1960, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, this gentleman's brother-in-law, Eugene Wigner, wrote an extremely influential essay called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics, something that's been debated for many years since then. Uh, I suspect that some of that derived from conversations with, uh, with, with Dirac, but I'm not trying to take any credit away from uh, Wigner for writing an essay that uh, has, uh, has engendered so much uh, discussion over, over the years. You all know the arguments. You know, why is it that we can uh, set out theories that go from a kind of platonic mathematical ideal into uh, and, and use them to express the laws of nature so profitably? 
But I detect that we're going into something now that is beyond the unreasonable uh, effectiveness of mathematics to, to what I think you might better describe as the unreasonable centrality of mathematics. I mean, who now de uh, de could deny that, uh, that it is pretty much impossible to imagine that the laws of nature are written in any other way? They are the mathematics, state-of-the-art mathematics is cropping up all over uh, 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 fundamental physics. Uh, when, when people embark on fundamental new programs, they find themselves colliding with their friends in the math mathematics department. This strikes me as being singular. What I set myself the task of in this book is to try to it's a, it's a difficult task, just like writing this chap's biography here, which Martin Rees advised me not to do, incidentally, um, uh, to try to bring some of the excitement home of that, uh, of this, uh, this centrality. And one of the things that prompted me to do this, apart from my own interest in the subject, is that, as you'll be well aware, there's a, in, among the what you might call the commentariat there is a lot of criticism of, of very mathematical theoretical physics, in particular string theory, but other types of well, multiverse and what have you. Uh, everyone's entitled to opinion. That's what makes science drives it forward. And it, it's fundamentally democratic uh, um, uh, credential, so to speak, ma make it what it is. But it, it, I must say that I remember hearing a, a discussion on a BBC radio program one morning, just after I finished, I was, I was, in fact, I was in the middle of my, the book I wrote after Dirac, and I heard this discussion where a, a layperson, not a fool, but a layperson, was basically saying that string theory wasn't physics, and that uh, you know physicists had lost their minds, and they'd lost their bearings, they'd lost their, uh, all sense of historical context and what have you. And I was really very upset about this, because the only people that they put up against this gentleman right, was an experimenter, my friend John Butterworth, lovely guy, but he doesn't know anything about this subject. And it, this, in my opinion, is becoming pervasive now. Right? It may not be he true here, but there are a lot of very, very well-informed people right, who think that the kind of, much of the physics that you do here is basically la-la land stuff, got nothing to do with the real world and what have you. Now, I know that's not true, right? but I think there is, a, is room out there for a, 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 a polite conversation with the general public to explain why we're doing what we're doing here now, that we haven't taken leave of our senses and that there is a reason for what we're doing, uh, uh, doing now. Now, very, very quickly, uh, I just want to introduce myself, let you know where I'm coming from, as they, uh, they now say, give you some idea of, uh, of how I came uh, uh, to uh, be where I am writing that book. And finally, um, um, very quickly, what I hope to achieve by being here, what I hope I can contribute to, uh, to uh, li uh, life here uh, at, at the Institute. I guess my scientific life began, if I could, if I could date it, to a, uh, to a, a door knock when I was 15 years old in the sub suburban town of Orpington, where I happened, by virtue of a, su a Sunday, excuse me, a Saturday job, to knock on the door of somebody who was a theoretical physicist, who I always used to think, well, they all had huge manes of ha uh, hair, they always away with the fairies. And I met this gentleman by the name of John Bendel, who became a huge impact on my life. He's now well retired, uh, but was a huge impact on my life. Uh, because not just was not just because of his friendliness, but because he introduced me to this person here, who was his hero, total hero. He, uh, this fellow, uh, John Bendel, uh, read the principles of quantum mechanics every Christmas. He named his daughter Paula. His cat was Adrian. Uh, I mean, uh, you name it. I mean, he is a serious fanatic, right? Uh, and the great disservice he did to me here was that he he said. Well, you know, you, you can follow in this in, in, in this path. So, of course, I went it, toddled in, and did theoretical physics, thinking that we could all write papers like this guy. And I got a rude shock, of course, later on, as you can uh, you can imagine. Very few people have the gifts that, uh, that uh, Dirac had, and we'll talk about that in another talk. But my career after that was what I call rectilinear. Uh, I, it wasn't a it wasn't a struggle in terms of because of state provision and because of parental support. Uh, I uh, got, uh, got my first degree, second degree, I got tenure at the Open University, which is the world's largest distance teaching education uh, in, institution, and then moved on, 
having uh, realized that I wasn't going to be a great researcher, far too interested in uh, the people uh, behind the subject in its history, uh, not nearly um, uh, 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 intellectually powerful enough to compete at the level I wanted to compete at. But that, there we are. Not everyone can be Roger Federer. I realized that. Uh, uh, and that was the position uh, I found myself in. But still love, uh, loved the subject very dearly. Well, I moved into the museum world in 1990 when I became uh, an assistant director. Uh, later on, I became assistant director at the Science Museum in, in London. And my contribution there was to try to bring contemporary science into the museum world, one of the largest museums in the world uh, about science. And I was always astonished about how out of date museums were and how little they had to say about things that were terribly important to me. For example... You take the two biggest revolutions in 20th century physics, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics and relativity, and there's nothing in, the, the, in most museums on those subjects. That, is, that struck me as being extraordinary. And I made it my, uh, um, my aim, so to speak, to work with my colleagues to try to increase the amount uh, of, uh, of, of the representation of, uh, uh, of uh, physics and indeed modern science at, in the Science Museum and, uh, and, and elsewhere. But all that time, uh, I was yearning to get back into the field that you're working in. Um, uh, to, to quote an Eagles lyric, uh, uh, this was the, my, my position in theoretical physics, you can check out, but you can never leave. And on the tw uh, 8th of August, 2002, I found myself on the SS Great Britain, having just given a talk at the Dirac Centenary, exactly 100 years after the, uh, the, the, the great uh, physicist uh, was, was, was born in Bristol. And I found myself on that boat and talked with and hit it off with his younger daughter, Monica. And I thought, this is my chance, right? Uh, I knew there was a biography of Dirac, quite a good one, actually, by Helga Krog. Didn't have the benefit of the internet, a lot of good stuff in it. But I thought, if I know the family, there's a chance here I could, uh, uh, I, I could make some uh, impact on this. And I had, as I'll mention in my next talk, the most amazing luck. And I do believe in luck, actually because things were coming out there that had never come out before, and they fell into my lap, which was a, a great honor and, and delight for me. After that, I made what many people regard as a bizarre decision to write a book about the um, Winston Churchill and the nuclear bomb. Uh, the reason why I did that, there were two reasons. First of all, I ask you to imagine how you'd feel if you would, had been, or, uh, for 10 years, ridiculing the prospect of some state-of-the-art topic in your subject ever having any military use, then there had been a catastrophic world war, and then you finding yourself working in, in private, in secret, for the government. Right? Because that's exactly the position that dozens, in the end, hundreds of physicists and chemists found themselves in the war. And the particular perspective, including this one, incidentally, this, this, he was one of the people that worked on that project, doing state-of-the-art applied mathematics, neutron diffusion and what have you, in his back garden in Cambridge. I was fascinated by that intersection with the fact that Churchill, I didn't know this when I started, so this was a piece of luck, I didn't realise that Churchill was the best-known writer on the future of science in British popular newspapers in the 1930s, and he wrote dozens of articles, dozens of articles about the coming nuclear age. Right? I didn't know, for example, in 1926, when quantum mechanics was red hot, that Winston Churchill, a rumbunctuous Chancellor of the Exchequer, put aside the most important speech of the year and it spent two hours dictating a summary of quantum theory. It used to me, I've read it, I've seen it, I've held it in my hand. So... Uh, this, good? excuse me. Was it any good? It's not bad, actually. No, I'm serious. It's not bad for a lay person. It's, it's, it's. A bit. What amazes me is that he would want to do that. You know, it's, it absolutely amazes me. And his his sagacity was remarkable. Eight weeks before the dis uh, discovery of nuclear fission in Berlin, Nazi-run Berlin, he wrote in the most popular newspaper in the world the news of the world, that we could be on the edge of a nuclear age at this, at this awfully frightening time in world history. This is absolutely amazing to me. I did not know that before I started. Anyway, that's what drove me into that uh, what some anomalous uh, uh, project. All the while, uh, owing to my uh, annual visits to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which have been enormously helpful to me, uh, I had been haunted by 
some of the things this gentleman said. He would hate it if you called him a philosopher. He would absolutely hate that. Although he was taught general relativity by a philosopher, incidentally. But he, although nothing like the same stature of Einstein as a, as a thinker about the nature of the subject, he did do and make some remarkably straightforward and telling contributions to, uh, to the nature of, uh, to our thinking about the nature of physics. And one of them was drawn to my attention by Nadi Seiberg, the famous quantum field theorist, string theorist. And I remember him doing this one Saturday afternoon in the gym in, uh, at the Institute, where he was there under spousal pressure to try and get into some shape. And he asked me if I'd seen a paper that Dirac had written in 1939 called The Relation Between Mathematics and Physics. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you do nothing else right, as a result of this talk and you don't speak to me, please go online and read that paper. Easily Googleable, damped, Cambridge, right? Dirac, relation between mathematics and physics. That paper, I submit, is a masterpiece, right? What is particularly amazing is that he discusses that subject without a single mathematical term in the, uh, in the paper. And I realized, after Natty pointed this out, that I'd, I completely missed its significance. I'd read it in my research and dismissed it because its language was so straightforward, so plain, right, that it couldn't possibly have any, uh, any moment. Later, I found, talking to Edward Witten, Maldasena, Arkani Hamed, that these people are talking about this paper still quite regularly as a masterpiece of its genre. Let me put up here a, uh, a quote from that paper that resonated me ever since I read it. This is Dirac in this paper, right? For non-specialist audiences, 1939, up at the University of Edinburgh, invited there by Max Born. He just says quite casually, the mathematician plays a game in which he himself invents the rules, while the physicist plays a game in which the rules are provided by nature. But as time goes on, it becomes increasingly evident that the rules which the mathematician finds interesting are the same as those which nature has chosen. Now, I love that. That, that to me is absolutely beautifully written because it is not fancy, there's no jargon, but it captures something that I think is, is, is profound. You add that the whole paper is a wonderful read, seriously, and you could give it to your family if they're not a scientist. Anyone can read this stuff. You add that to his great 1931 paper on magnetic monopoles. I call that his Hamlet because the paper is all over the place. You can see this guy has just got so much talent, right? So he's just so bubbling with ideas that he's throwing ideas all over the place, right? Like Hamlet, he's, uh, uh, Shakespeare's greatest play, but perhaps his least disciplined of, that, of those genres, right? You look at that 1931 paper, and you will see there the prediction of the positron, the prediction of the anti, uh, of, of the antiproton, right? You see the fantastic. Uh, paper or uh, his work on the uh, on the monopole, but at the beginning he sets out a new agenda for theoretical physics, saying that accelerators are now uh, or, or he will, or experiments are becoming so expensive that we may now have to take the lead from mathematics. Now I agree. I'm siding myself with the great Yang to saying this was one of the really great contributions uh, to the philosophy of theoretical physics, said in very plain terms, right up front. In, uh, in, in that paper. Again, well worth, uh, well worth reading. Anyway, stimulated by this, conversations with my, uh, with my friends at the Institute and elsewhere, I thought just maybe there is a prospect here of a, 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 a shorter book than the ones I've fortunately been writing uh, t to date. And I, I admit to one weakness, here, a substantial weakness here, that whenever I tend to write a book, I have, I have a, a Te tendency to cubricify the the subject, by which I mean even a simple idea I, I turn into something rather gr uh, grand in structure. That's not always a good thing, particularly for popular books. I remember Maldacena coming up to me and, and uh, with my Dirac book, and he said, this is very intimidating. Me intimidating Maldacena? I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, anyway, I'm determined to try to keep this, uh, this coming book in, in, in reasonable uh, proportions. And I just wanted to tell you very, in very general terms what its structure uh, is, very, very quickly. It's always interested me that if you play the same game that E.M. Forster did when he wrote his great 
uh, little book on aspects of the novel, he was talking about having great writers sitting around a table, just like they just walked in a room in the Doctor Who episode. So you have Shakespeare there, you have um, uh, um, uh, George Eliot, you have Dickens, uh, you know Steinbeck, and what have you, and you imagine them talking about their, their craft. Now, historians hate this for good reason, but as physicists, we can't help but imagine what if Isaac Newton were to walk in here now? Right? What, what if Maxwell were to walk in here now? It's irresistible. I know it's not legit his, historically, but that's it's. Oh, since my research began on this, which was 18 months ago, I started to realize how much historians have got to teach us about how different what you are doing now is to what Newton was doing. He would be very puzzled to come and find out what you are doing now, right? He, uh, his, the, the kind of God-given mathematical laws that we, we think we're seeking now, that wasn't the way Newton thought at all. That I didn't realize this in my stupendous ignorance, but modern physics, basically, if you look at the subject as we now see it, it, it it's best credited with Laplace and his colleagues in France around just after the French Revolution. I'd always thought this was something that came straight from Newton, but I do, without denying for one second Newton's preeminent genius, it's the only time you'll ever hear me use the word genius, right? Uh, the subject has a much more torturous history than physicists often uh, give, it, give it credit for. So I, I chose to begin, I'm working with a lot of historians here, and I know you could begin it, I don't know, with a person getting out of, off its back legs in the, uh, in the African savannah, but I'm going to begin it with, uh, with Isaac Newton, and then uh, uh, from the scientific revolution go through to Laplace, where physics was really invented with a modern sense of, of Newtonianism. That's when it began in 1800, right? Maxwell, Hamilton, Dirac, Einstein up to the period which Freeman Dyson has, with his typical provocativeness, has called the divorce between mathematics and physics, where he said that the subjects are basically separated, each claiming they had no further use for each other, which is a gross oversimplification, but good enough to, uh, to, uh, to uh, I think, provoke, uh, provoke thought. The second part of my book, which is what I'm researching here, I put all that historical stuff aside, uh, for, uh, for another few months is after the mid 70s which is when I began my graduate work uh, I think physics has taken a distinctly different tone I remember, I, seriously I still remember now as if it were yesterday rather like the, uh, uh, the uh, release of Sergeant Pepper or something I still remember right, being a graduate student and 25 days after becoming a graduate student the Jabe Psi was discovered and I remember that excitement, the pandemonium of seeing this incredible particle that really was not very well predicted by theoreticians and the fantastic interplay between theorists and experiment. And I confess to you, I thought, this is what physics is like. This is what I've read about in books. It's physicists working arm in arm with experimenters. And of course, now we know that that is by no means always the case. We might wish it were otherwise, but... I want to uh, try to trace how this uh, difference has, has happened, the reason why it's happened, it's, uh, and there are no uh, um, ill motives for, uh, for, uh, for that uh, trajectory. Now, I'm particularly ble pleased to be here during the quantum uh, gravity workshop here, of course, uh, and there are a whole bunch of things that I'd be uh, very glad to discuss. There may be things that have occurred to you that haven't occurred to me, which, is, which, is, which would be absolutely terrific. But among the sort of things I'd, I'd like to discuss obviously, would be that centrality I spoke about. Do you regard that as a miracle, or do you regard it as hardly surprising, since we have brought mathematics to the study of the world, so mathematics is going to be what uh, generates ideas? There's legitimate debate on that, of course. Examples of where mathematics has been surprisingly effective to you. Maybe you think like Richard Feynman has said on the record that it's getting out of hand now. I suspect he, this is how Feynman talking, not me, you know, that nature is a good deal less complicated than we're making it. Maybe you suspect that. I don't know. You know far better than I do what, uh, what, what, what the community are, are thinking. Do you agree with Steve Weinberg, who told me at the University of Texas at, at Austin a few, a few months ago that he was actually sad about the state of fundamental theoretical physics now? He said he knows people who are making great careers who've never made a prediction in their lives. He feels that we're waiting for a, a, an experimental discovery to kick particle physicists up the backside. That was, that's a slightly cleaned up version of what he actually <laughs> said to me. Or do you agree with Arkhani Khamed, 
who thinks that he's living in, uh, uh, as Dickens would say, in the best of all possible, uh, not Dickens, who was the other chap, best, uh, best, best of all possible worlds, that this is a great time to be working because the problems that the standard model uh, of particle physics and linked up with com- cosmology are so serious that we are missing something seriously big. So there's a huge prize to be had. Who's right about those two things? Maybe both are. I'd be very happy to talk with anyone on or off the record. Uh, I, m- I would say I'm quite serious about this. I love it when people talk dirty, and I don't mean sexually. I mean about, about, about very frankly about their about their uh, ab- about the subject. And you have an absolute guarantee, said in front of your director, that nothing will be quoted, right, uh, uh, personally, uh, or even commonly in terms of this group, unless you, know, you have seen it. I, I think that's very important to give that uh, that guaranteed uh, uh, undertaking. If you want to see what I ri- uh, what I write before uh, it's published, I'm also very glad to uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to uh, to indulge you on that. This is my information. I'm here uh, till uh, uh, May the eighth. Uh, that's my room, room one two o two. First time I ever had a palm tree outside my office. I still can't quite. Quite get over it, and this is my uh, my email address here. Um, and if, whenever you see me around, uh, 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 you know who I am now. Uh, please know that uh, I won't be interrupting you. I'm very respectful of the t- uh, that you're here to, uh, to be shut away for if you like from the real real world. But if you do want to speak to a tame uh, writer who's very keen to represent what you do faithfully, uh, then. Uh, then I would be deeply grateful if you'd call on me, come to see me anytime you like. I'm around Santa Barbara virtually the whole time until, uh, until I leave. So thank you very much again for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Fundamental. No. It's not clear anything's fundamental. Uh, no. And uh, they would even dispute that pi has any special. Hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're quite digits right. Digits of pi are special or anything like that. So, yep. Yep. so no, you're uh, quite right. have you looked at their work? I or, have. Is there any merit to it? I, I have. I mean, my own view is again, I'm happy to be disabused of this, but my own view is that mathematicians, but gen, not gen, I mustn't use the word generally, is the word of mathematics, but. The great majority are hardcore Platonists. They believe they are discovering things that are out there to be discovered. I also believe, with a little bit more authority, just a little, that physicists are like that. I think that's why that's why they have places like this funded, because there are things that can be discovered, right? And yet I know that philosophically there are people out there who believe this is a complete nonsense. Uh, now, my view is that there's never going to be an experiment to distinguish between those two things, right? And that, <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd like that. Um, but, that we, that, but one can carry on regard. But I have to say my book is not going to be a philosophy book. I promise my... But you're absolutely right to draw, draw attention to that. Uh, um, I, asked, I asked Edward Witten about this, incidentally. You know, he doesn't waste many words. And I asked him if he believed that uh, mathematics was out to be discovered. Yes. Uh, are the laws of physics out there to be discovered? Yes. That was it. You know, and I, th- I, I don't think physicists tend to be that interested in developing the subject. But it may be that you disagree with that. And I'd be very happy to talk to people who are exceptions to that. So, so what about a lot of physics problems which can be formulated mathematically, but which are so terribly complicated that we have no way to solve them? For example, Navier-Stokes equations in turbulence regimes or, or the Hubbard model. Well, that, okay. we, we know exactly how to formulate mathematically what, we, what it's supposed to be like, Yes. but we have no way of solving it. Maybe our ignorance. Is, is that ignorance or is there some fundamental problem? I, 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 I'm afraid that's pay up way above my pay grade, that one. Uh, <laughs> there, you know... Uh, um, what can I say? Uh, they're always very difficult. I mean, I remember Freeman, uh, Frank Wilczek once told me that, uh, that Freeman Dyson said, strong interaction, 
it'll be decades before anyone... I think he said that 1970. Um, <laughs> <laughs> before Cruz, Will Check, and what have you come along. So I think it's dangerous to say... There were, rather like I think it's dangerous to say that string theory will never be tested. You hear these people saying very incautiously. I mean, I, I, you know, I never say never. Uh, uh, I think one's always got to be very cautious when predicting, especially about the future. So I really would encourage people to interrupt Graham. Graham, I would encourage you yeah. to, uh, to indeed walk in the, the visitor's office. Don't be shy. A special thing about being here is that the visitors have nothing else to do. So if, I'm attacked, if I'm attacked by somebody's office, I can come to you. Can I? <laughs> okay. okay, good. Okay, and I might say I'm an I'm a any time any place person. So uh, you know, if you prefer to speak early in the morning or in the evening or what have you, that's fine by me. It's just a privilege for me to talk to so many first-rate uh, um, theoretical physicists. So thank yeah, you so again for coming. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.